right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so my name is Nicholas Boucher. I am a PhD candidate at the University of Cambridge, and I'm here today to talk to you about a paper titled Bad Characters, Imperceptible NLP Attacks. Uh, and I'd just like to start by acknowledging co-authors uh, Ilya Chemailov, Ross Anderson, and Nicholas Pepperdell. Uh, so text-based machine learning is broken, and it's broken at a pretty fundamental level. Uh, so all machine learning models consuming text as input are vulnerable to adversarial examples uh, that are entirely imperceptible to human users. And in this talk, we're going to talk about how to craft those attacks, what this means for the ecosystem, and uh, give a real call to action for the deployment of defenses against this style of attack. So uh, let's start off with a figure that uh, everyone here has seen before. Uh, you've likely seen this in the highly impactful 2015 uh, paper where we uh, begin by defining adversarial examples, which are uh, effectively benign inputs to models with added perturbations that purposefully output incorrect results at the time of inference. Uh, and when it comes to the visual domain, we can subtly change pixel values without human perception. It's, it's actually pretty straightforward. You can you know, change these minute values uh, to an amount that's significant to machine learning models, but insignificant to humans, and you end up being able to take an image of a panda and have it be classified as a given or uh, something much more adversarial like uh, misclassifying stop signs in self-driving cars or, or something like that. Uh, but what does it mean to craft adversarial examples in the text domain? Uh, you know, text is a very discrete uh, form of communication. It's uh, information that uh, tends to change drastically if you, you change anything about it. You know, you can't subtly tweak the uh, color value, a color channel value of something in text. You have to entirely change uh, a letter or change a word or a sentence structure or, or something like that. And when it comes to machine learning in general, NLP is a very successful application of machine learning. So a reasonable question to ask would be, is it exempt from these sort of adversarial example attacks? Well, well, the answer to that is, is absolutely no. And, and there has been some previous work here. So uh, previous work in adversarial uh, text-based attacks have tried to do things like purposefully misspelling words or paraphrasing sentences and things like this, things that would um, you know, somehow change the text that's being ingested into the model uh, with an aim to output an incorrect result from that model. And you know, why, why would you want to do that? You could imagine systems like toxic content detection, machine translation, sentiment analysis, and uh, given uh, how much of the world operates uh, online, you know, on the internet these days, a, a lot of these text-based uh, machine learning systems are, are actually pretty significant to, to society in the, the modern world. So uh, let's talk about Unicode. Uh, Unicode is the de facto standard that we use for uh, encoding our text in the modern era. It contains uh, a little less than 150,000 characters in the current version of the specification. And it turns out that it gives us many different ways to perturb text without having any sort of visual effect on the, uh, the rendering, the display of that text. Uh, and, and why is this significant? It's significant because we can effectively modify the encoding of text to attack machine learning models that ingest text uh, without changing the way that that text looks whatsoever. So now we're kind of reframing how we look at text-based uh, uh, adversarial example attacks, and, and we're not looking at changing um, you know, the, the letters or the words or the sentences. We're looking at changing the underlying encoding uh, with an aim to represent text uh, visually in uh, the exact same way as whatever benign input that we are attempting to perturb. So there's four techniques that I would like to deep dive into. So uh, the first of which is the concept of invisible characters. And uh, we'll define invisible characters as characters that render to the absence of a glyph. Uh, and an example of this is what's up on the screen, the zero width space. Uh, this is a character in Unicode. It's, it's one of many that we would define as an invisible character. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a, it's a space character that's exactly zero pixels wide. 
uh, and why would you want things like this? Well, it turns out that in certain settings, this may be helpful for various formatting purposes, but in the general uh, usage of text, uh, it would have no effect uh, whatsoever on the surrounding text. And this is really handy because it means that we can inject these arbitrarily into some string, uh, effectively changing the encoding of that string uh, or the binary representation of that string without changing the way that that string, that text renders. Uh, and this is really nice because most uh, NLP models will treat uh, these sort of uh, invisible characters as either unknown tokens uh, in their embedding space or some kind of dedicated uh, you know, zero width space token, for example. But uh, both of those different avenues will uh, result in some change to the embedding space for whatever model we're discussing, uh, which means that we're very likely going to have some impact on the output of that model. So let's talk about another technique that we could use, uh, something called homoglyphs. And if you haven't come across this before, it's a really simple idea. These are distinct characters that render to either exactly the same or nearly the same glyph. Uh, so on the example that we have on the screen, we have two characters that look like the Latin letter H that we would use in English, but on the uh, left-hand side of the screen, we actually have a Cyrillic character that is a, a homoglyph of the Latin H. Uh, and uh, some of the best examples happen to come from, from Latin and Cyrillic, although we also have the Greek alphabet and, and uh, many others. And uh, what's, what's nice about this is that we can take these different characters and we can substitute them within strings, once again finding a way to change the encoding of text without changing the visual display of that text. And I'd like to call out that homoglyphs are actually reasonably dense within the Unicode specification. So what you're looking at here is a dimensionality reduced clustering of rendered characters that we put into a visual model with the aim here just to uh, try to uh, motivate the fact that there are actually quite a lot of homoglyphs in the Unicode specification, which means that we have a, a large number of opportunities to substitute characters once again, changing the binary representation of text without changing the way that that text is displayed. Uh, so let's talk about a third technique. The third technique we'll talk about is reorderings. And these are techniques that change the logically encoded order of characters without changing, once again, the way that those characters are displayed. So, so how do we do this? So it turns out that uh, you know, in human language, we write in both the left to right direction and the right to left direction. Uh, and sometimes we want to have very fine-grained control uh, over the order of text when we mixed uh, the languages of different directionalities. So to support this, Unicode has control characters that support overriding uh, the sensible default directionalities that Unicode will, will give you. And we can leverage these control characters to purposefully, adversarially change the display order of text. So if you look at the graphic that we have on the screen here, you'll see that uh, we, we are looking at some rendered text that looks like it says ABC, but the underlying encoding, which is on the bottom of the screen, actually logically encodes in the order CBA, but it's just displaying in an environment that shows code, uh, that shows text as right to left instead of left to right. Uh, so this one is really nice. It happens to be my favorite trick. Uh, it allows us to drastically change the encoded representation of text uh, with some overall fairly straightforward ideas. And uh, if you don't like those first three techniques, we'll talk about one more. This is the fourth one. We'll call it deletions. Uh, this is where we can inject arbitrary characters of, of any kind into a string, and then we purposefully delete those characters by injecting uh, a control character that will remove the preceding character, the most obvious example of which is the backspace, uh, you know, just the same uh, character that's injected from the button that you hit on your keyboard. Uh, and this is very nice because uh, it allows us to inject highly targeted things into text. We can take some string and we could put some substring uh, you know, embedded inside of that string and just throw a few backspace characters after it. Uh, and all of a sudden, um, we've added something into the binary representation of text that's highly targeted, once again, without changing the display order. So how does all of this come together? Well. Uh, we consider a genetic algorithm. And uh, in this genetic algorithm, we're uh, trying to uh, optimize these four different techniques uh, to either maximize the distance from the uh, correct class for any given target model, or minimize the distance to a target uh, targeted class uh, if we happen to be running a, a targeted uh, attack. So this is uh, kind of the same uh, concept that would exist in any sort of adversarial example uh, uh, 
attack pattern within uh, machine learning systems. It just so happens that we are using these four different techniques of perturbing text at the encoding or binary level without changing the visual representation of that text. And uh, using this, we can craft adversarial examples that target specific uh, models and, and visual inputs to those models. So uh, much uh, more detail about this genetic algorithm is in the paper for time limitations. I'm not going to go into uh, the mechanics of that right now, but it's, it's just an optimization algorithm that we're using to uh, try to craft these targeted attacks. So let's look at a few different examples. So uh, in this particular example, uh, we consider a machine translation model that's translating from English to French. Uh, so on the top left-hand side of the screen, we have the benign input to this model. It's in English. It says a black box in your car. Uh, and we translate that to French. This just comes from a large corpus of data that we uh, happen to attack inside of uh, the paper. Uh, but then on the bottom hand side of the uh, screen, you'll see that we are uh, using uh, a reordering. We're actually just switching the order of two characters in this string. We're switching the order of the L and the A. But well, when this text renders, uh, you, you don't see that there's anything different because we've offset uh, the, uh, the underlying logically encoded order change with these control characters that will uh, swap the display order back to the same as the benign text. But uh, we get this really interesting output, which is that when we attempt to uh, run inference on this model translating into French, in the bottom right-hand side of the screen, you see that we just get absolute garbage output that appears to have no meaning whatsoever, despite uh, putting something into the model that looks exactly the same as what we had on the top left-hand side of the screen. So uh, let's look at a second example. In this example, we will look at toxic content detection, which is actually something that's pretty significant in modern society and perhaps fundamental to certain parts of, of the internet. Uh, so uh, consider the text, you are a coward and a fool, which would normally classify on the model that we tested as 96.8% toxic. Well, it turns out that we inject just uh, five different random characters in the ASCII range followed by deletion characters right after them, which is what we're doing on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, we will end up uh, lowering that to 8.2% toxic, uh, meaning that if I have some sort of system that's trying to gate what I can post on, say, a forum or a social media environment or something like that, I can effectively bypass uh, the toxic content filter uh, by using uh, just one of the four different techniques that we talked about. And we actually looked at a whole bunch of different uh, tasks uh, in our experiments. We looked at machine learning, textual entailment, uh, toxic content detection, a whole bunch of others. Uh, and we also looked at models from a variety of different uh, large technology companies that are well-known producers and publishers of models online. Many of the models that we looked at are actively deployed production models, and we find that um, every model that we looked at was uh, vulnerable to uh, being able to generate adversarial examples using these uh, kind of imperceptible perturbations uh, that we are uh, generating using Unicode. And uh, just as a, as a mile-high overview, I'll, I'll throw up a, a few of the kind of more technical results here. So uh, we'll look in the top left at, at Google Translate and the top right at a textual entailment model produced by Facebook. In the bottom left uh, at a sentiment analysis model that uh, is just a common one published on Hugging Face, and uh, in the bottom right at a toxic content detection model produced by IBM. And uh, what's most important here is just the trends of all of these graphs. You'll see that uh, as we increase our perturbation budget, which uh, we're just defining as uh, one injection or one um, you know, uh, usage of one of the four techniques that we described as a, a single perturbation budget. As we increase that, we notice the performance of these models decreases drastically, um, different metrics for each of these different uh, settings, but uh, we see that the performance will drop from very good with uh, no perturbations. By the time we get to five, we drop down to near zero performance for most of the models that we looked at. But rather than looking at the kind of technical numerical graphs uh, in this setting, let's just try and summarize that as saying, in the, the broadest sense, the general trend is that when we added one injection of one of these Unicode perturbations, we saw a significant performance loss in whatever model we were targeting. But by the time we added three injections, we were functionally breaking the model. We saw a performance that dropped uh, very low, often approaching zero, uh, meaning that sort of uh, 
If you think back to the example earlier, that garbage output when you expected French to appear, you saw just a bunch of random characters. That's the sort of thing that we can achieve by injecting uh, a few of these perturbations. So let's talk about defense. Uh, there's actually a couple of different ways to defend against these sort of attacks, uh, one of which is some deterministic pre-processing of text before ingestion into a machine learning pipeline for inference. Uh, so this would mean things like, for example, resolving control characters before ingestion into a machine learning pipeline. Uh, it would mean things like taking homoglyphs uh, and substituting them for a common character that you decide ahead of time, at training time, or something like that for your, your model. Uh, but there's actually a totally a different approach that you could take as well, which uh, sounds a little bit crazy, but, uh, but bear with me on the idea. Uh, you can use something like optical character recognition, where you take the text that you would have being ingested into a model traditionally as you know, these uh, encoded bytes and actually render that text to an image pass it through an OCR model, uh, which will then take it back to text that you then uh, run through your downstream task, um, whatever it is that you're hoping to do. And while this definitely adds computational overhead to a machine learning pipeline, what it's seeking to do is to unify uh, these kind of encoded representations and these visual representations using something that doesn't require you to uh, kind of hard code a bunch of deterministic steps. But uh, let's just summarize that a little bit more broadly is uh, machine learning architects should sand sanitize their inputs. And this is a, a key lesson that we've seen in computer security for many decades. You know, when we think about uh, SQL databases, if you have user input that's going into that database, you're certainly going to sanitize it in some way before you uh, dump it to a file. But uh, when it comes to machine learning, it seems that the approach is we'll just take whatever a user gives as input and throw it into the model. But uh, the claim that we're making here is that you should be sanitizing inputs, if nothing else, to look for these different Unicode perturbations and try and standardize to something that your model can actually handle. So uh, to phrase that a little bit differently, text-based machine learning pipelines must change in the current state. We can evade toxic content detection. We can break machine translation, named entity recognition, and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, and the integrity of any system using large language models or, or just language models in general is at risk from invisible attacks until defenses are retrofitted onto existing systems. So uh, let's just do a final summary to conclude here. Uh, Unicode can imperceptibly perturb text uh, and these encoding level perturbations uh, functionally equate to adversarial examples that we can use uh, against various machine learning models. And defenses should be deployed uh, against these attacks. So uh, we have a whole bunch more things in the paper. I would encourage you to check it out. We talk about availability attacks, attack transferability, uh, the specific algorithms we're using, search engines, and a whole bunch more. Uh, you can find a summary of the paper at this website, imperceptible.ml, uh, as well as a link off to the actual paper itself. Uh, once again, my name is Nicholas Boucher. Thank you very much for attending this talk, and I would be happy to take any questions. All right, we have a couple minutes for questions. Please um, walk up to the mic and state your name and affiliation, please. Uh, great talk. Uh, Guan Hong from Purdue University. So I have a question. So what's the difference of your attack and uh, the previous attack that uh, actually perturb those characters? And actually, at, uh, from the model's point of view, actually those uh, like input is just like unknown words. So what's the difference between these two except from the imperceptible like point of view? Sorry, you said what's the the difference between yeah. these and uh, the previous uh, like previous. Atta attacks, like uh, changing those characters to different characters? Yeah, absolutely. So, so what's the difference between this attack and the things that have existed previously uh, in the literature? Well, well, the big difference is that a human can't see these attacks. So if I have some string uh, that I publish online and I'm hoping that you will copy and paste it into some model or I'm, I'm trying to deceive someone in some way, that deception is much more likely to succeed if that perturbation isn't something that's going to be observable directly by a human without looking at encoded bytes. Uh, in all of the previous work, uh, the sort of perturbations that you would see are things that would actually have a visual change on the text. You could see that a word was misspelled or that you added a word or uh, changed the order of words in a sentence or paraphrased something, something like this. So there are, there's definitely strong work um, in uh, kind of the prior setting that has uh, visual effect, but uh, we're seeking to do something that we believe is significantly more deceptive. Uh, so a follow-up follow uh, question. So do you think it's a, a better way to like have a more robust model against those like unknown words? Because like uh, 
from the uh, attack, uh, the model point of view, actually the input is just unknown embedding, right? Uh, yeah. So um, you know, with with all adversarial examples, like the, the it is a valid input that is being ingested into the model. Like these uh, perturbed Unicode strings are valid inputs to a model. They just happen to produce really um, awful results. So um, you know, what form that takes within the model is it. Uh, an unknown token that's being embedded in the model, or um, you know, is it something totally different? And you know, it turns out these days people are doing all sorts of things um, that are more complicated than just using dictionaries to do embeddings uh, into models. So, um, yeah, if it's uh, the ability to handle unknown tokens, I mean, unknown tokens mess up all sorts of things. And kind of modern transformer-based attention models, uh, unknown tokens can cause all sorts of havoc on um, you know things that are otherwise unaffected within the same string. So, uh, I think. That's the sort of line of thinking that I think of with these attacks. And um, because we have defenses that we can deploy against them, uh, the strong encouragement that I would give is for model architects to build those into the uh, pre-inference stage within their pipelines. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, you're running out of time. So if you can take this question offline, so they'll be absolutely great. Um, let's thanks once again, Nicholas. Thank you.